Well, I'd like to go ahead and invite the people to come here into the room so we can do our Bible study. We'll, we'll give a few minutes until uh, Chris and Rich get here. Um, maybe Melissa will be here in a few moments. Um, I think Carrie will be coming today. So why don't we just invite them to come up and... Is he losing his grip on reality? No, simply making an obvious statement for a characteristic, an, an illustration. How about if I did this? This one would be a lot more acceptable in prayer. Lord, we invite you to join us here in this place. Lord, be with us as we... Wait a minute. Is there ever a time when the Lord is not in this place? How about the f next floor down? Or, the f or any place. The psalmist writes, if I descend, if I make my bed in hell, you are, if I ascend into heaven, behold, you are there. Where can I go from your presence? So why is it that we oftentimes would say that, and we say many other such things that are, well, not consistent with the Lord's revealed truth. But I, I want to, because the Lord has directed me, just to focus on that one. Well, wait a minute. We just really need to... What? Ask him to be with us or recognize the fact that the Lord is here. Now, admittedly, sometimes, and maybe you would agree with this, it doesn't seem like he's here. I asked a couple of the brethren this morning, how you doing? And they answered, hey, man, I'm well in the Lord. That's one of my favorite lines because it's always true. But the question is, am I really experiencing that? Because there are times, even though the Lord is always here, and if you're a Christian, well, he's committed himself to be within you. He's always here. His promises are always sure. And I'm not telling one of you one thing, I believe, that you don't already know. But the Lord would remind us today to be aware of what the people in the text apparently were not aware. And the Lord gave that to us for an example. Hey, you know what they did? We can and perhaps often do. So as we go to him in prayer, now that's something we've done many times. It can become so much just a, a formula, singing his praises. Hey, what would that be like if Jesus was in that chair? What would that be like if Jesus was up here during the teaching? What would that be like if the Lord was in this place? Well, the Lord is in this place. For us to receive more of that, his fullness and grace for grace, something is required. That's the thing that's in view today. That's the thing that the Lord and the Lord alone is able to do. And us, well, we need to come to him and ask. Father, we do. Lord, with the grace that you supply, seek to focus upon you, Lord. We just pray that you would make that so for every one of us that desires. Lord, that we would see you Lord says high and lifted up above all things Lord for those of us you've redeemed and those of us you've taught that we would see ourselves as there with you this morning and not just now Father that's a need for all eternity and more than that it's a reality Lord you so clearly and I'm so grateful struck me with the phrase from the song that you picked for us this morning and I think that impact is clear evidence that you did pick it, Lord. I stood here with you, before you, Lord, with my brothers and sisters and said, I won't move without you. Father, I have often moved without you. Perhaps with good intentions, perhaps based on my understanding. And in truth, Lord, I can, no matter where I go, you are there, but there is that way Father, where you're well-pleased, where you're in fellowship with me and with us. So as I acknowledge those things, Lord, I, I, I just bring before you, Lord, that's the cry of the new heart that you've given all of us. Lord, even as your servant Moses said, if you don't go with us, 
we're not going. Lord, you've given me these points to bring before your people. I'm just saying, Father, if you don't do it, if you don't present the teaching, I'm not willing to move. Father, may for all who hear have the, the same perspective. Lord, if it's not your perspective, then I'm not going to accept it. If it's another one competing, I, I won't go there. Lord, bring us in the reality and experience of your presence. Bring forth your word, Lord, that you would bring your glory to yourself and your children, Lord, would be so filled with your joy and your presence and would so bear your fruit. We ask these things, Father, and we do thank you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen? Quick review to get us reinitiated here in the book of Joshua. We already covered some of it. Well, the Lord has said that the Old Testament for the Christian contains examples for us. Things to do, things not to do. We're going to very clearly see that today. And in that, well, metaphoric or symbolic form, Israel was given a promise in the form of, well, a covenant, what we know as the Old Covenant, and it was meant to teach them and show them their need for what we have, if you're a Christian, in Jesus Christ. It was to show them their utter inability to do the good things of God, no matter how much they wanted it, no matter how hard they tried. They just simply wouldn't be able to do that. The Lord tells us clearly, the law was a tutor, a teacher, an instructor to bring us to Jesus. Well, we might logically ask the next question. For what purpose? Okay, I've come to Jesus, and I have. And if you're a Christian, and most if not many of you are, well, I'm, so we're good now, right? Well, imagine a further example, being God's people, being in the place where he wants you, a good place, but it isn't all good. It's not fully good. You see, that's exactly where we are in the text this morning. As we've been studying verse by verse, God, well, gave them a similar situation, a promise. Hey, I've prepared a place for you. Does that sound a little bit similar to what Jesus said? I go away to prepare a place for you. Well, before Israel was given the land of Canaan, God promised, hey, I've got a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, and he gave them so many more promises, and he promised that he's going to bring them into it. And, well, the first time around, God's people just didn't believe God, and it it required them to spend a little bit more time in extra training. It was like the longest summer school ever, if you will, 40 years in the desert. Discipline, training, preparation, all those things, realizing that God is present and good for his word, a people prepared to enter into, well, the promised land. That's what the book of Joshua is in stages. Oh, and of course, the things that intimidated them before the giants, the hostile people, enemies. They were subdued too. And there was land promised for every tribe and it was apportioned, given out to the tribes. That's where we, well, finished up many, many weeks now and several teachings with many essential points. But to bring us to this conclusion, if you have your Bibles open here in Joshua, chapter 21. And I'm going to ask you to put on, well, the Lord's perspective this morning, because we have a clear statement in just a couple verses, beginning in Joshua 21, verse 43, where we read, so the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not 
a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Is that true? It should be an easy question. It's the word of God. Of course it's true, right? Beginning to end, it's all true. But maybe you've already been in that position. Um, they're in the land. They got all that the Lord had promised came to pass. And all that, wait a minute. Let me ask you a quick review question. Have all the tribes dispossessed, that means driven out, the inhabitants of the land that they were now inheriting? No, several of them. Are all the tribes living in the land originally that God intended them to? No. Classically, you know, not discounting the eastern two and a half tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. How about Dan? If you were with us on the Wednesday night teaching in the map, you know, that little Dan is in, they're over here by the Mediterranean Sea on the map, and then they're up north. Why up north? Well, it was hard down here by the sea, so they found a, a peaceful people, and they, they decided we wanted this, and they took that. Well, then how can we look at this and think, well, there's the issue. How do we think? Are we thinking that God's saying, and it was very good. No, what God is clearly saying is every good thing that he, the Lord, had promised to Israel had transpired. But that's not the same as saying it's all good. There's a certain perspective here that the Lord has given us as an example that we need to look at. And it begins with this understanding of the word Rest. We saw it in the text this morning. God's going to give them rest. And he said, well, they, they have rest. But, you know, that's not obviously the first time we've seen it in Joshua. So let's do this this morning. Let's go back and look at two places in Joshua. The first one is in Joshua chapter 1. And we'll jump right to the verse. It's the Lord speaking to Joshua and Joshua speaking to the people. In Joshua chapter 1, Verse 13, the Lord moves Joshua to remind the people of something that he had previously told them. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 13, they were told, please notice this first word, remember. It's going to be important for the title of the teaching today. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Is that past tense as though it had already happened? Oh, this gets a little trickier based on our understanding. Well, from the Lord's perspective, he had given them, but had they taken possession? No, that was still future for them at this point. The key word at the beginning of the verse, remember. The teaching for today, remember Jesus. If it's more helpful for you, remember the Lord, because we need to remember the Lord, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, right? It appears that perhaps they had forgotten something here. But there it is, before there was any battles, before Jericho, before you know, crossing of the Jordan, God had said, hey, the Lord is giving you these things and he's going to give you rest. Well, we saw rest again here in Joshua uh, chapter 14. Ask you to make your way there, please. In Joshua chapter 14, Verse 15, and again, we've previously covered the context. I just want to show you the summary verse. The name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. A little parenthetical information. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, the giant clan. Then the people had rest from war. Anybody's translation say that? No. Then the land had rest from war. 
Is it a distinction without a difference? No, I do not believe so. Let's turn now to a familiar chapter, New Testament. Hebrews chapter 4. On our mind freshly this morning is the concept of rest. You know, if, if we didn't just simply come to the Lord in faith for instruction, we think rest, you know, that's when, oh, that's when there's no crushing obligations. I can just kick back on the couch and have a siesta here or maybe gather with my Bible in just a pleasant place and, and just, well, the Lord has a very specific point on this. Written by the Lord through a Christian to Christians, the Lord tells all of them and all of this the following. Hebrews chapter 4, first 10 verses are key. Again, I know you've seen this before, I believe all of you, but I want to encourage you in light of what the Lord shows us today to really get with him as he leads and internalize, focus, do the very thing that the Lord shows. Meditate on this. Keep this always before us because the possibility exists that although there is a rest and although it was there, the people weren't in it, not the fullness of it. Not all of the, the people were driven out of the land. Not all of the possessions were taken, at least as far as the, the borders of the land. What does that matter to us? Very simply, and I'm glad that you might be thinking that this morning. If someone were to ask you later, hey, Christian, do you think you're enjoying everything that Christ has given you? Do you think as we walk amongst people who aren't saved, we represent Jesus as fully as is possible We'll leave out the as we want because our perspective is as he wants, what, what he has for them. Because here in this example, Israel said, I've given you all this. They're in. They're his people. God said, everything I promised in a certain way of looking at it has been given, but yet it's not everything that the Lord had said. If, if you're thinking it's all good just for memory uh, purposes or self-study, you can go back to Deuteronomy in chapter 28 and look at all the blessings and see if the people living in the time of Joshua have been experiencing all the things that God said. I will do all this for you. It's amazing. It's protection. It's provision. A people ahead of all other nations, just known to be God's people and Shortly, in a single word, Israel in the time of Joshua doesn't represent that. But yet God said in 21, those verses we looked at, they're in God's promises. He was faithful. So how do we think about that? Well, let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, and come back to that as we continue on through this this morning. It begins with a therefore, so it takes into account everything that was stated before chapter 3, immediately preceding, well, that's Israel's disobedience and, and failure under Moses to enter into the land. Now we're going to have a reference to Joshua, chapters 2 and the one before that. Hey, it's about Jesus and being so much better than everything that's in the law. So if we come at this with this perspective, no matter what we think about what Israel did, there's a reality that Hebrews starts out with that everything that you have in Christ, everything that he has given you is so much greater that's the book of Hebrews, the book of better things, better promises, better covenant. Right? So here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, seize on to that, Christian. If you haven't learned by now, when God makes a promise, it's because he wants the recipient to receive it. Right? I've got a promise from the Lord. Do I have it? Practically speaking, every Christian has this promise just like the Israelites had God's promises, but there were promises left unfulfilled. That's the problem. God was faithful with every promise that Israel took advantage of, that they took him at his word for, but they left a lot on the table or left a lot in the land, if you will. So Hebrews, 
is going to point us back to Joshua in a moment, but he's going to tell us, Christian, right now, there's a promise for you today, and it remains of entering his, the Lord's rest. So the question is, well, do we have it? In the fullness, the experience, well, to answer that, we have to know exactly what that is from his perspective. But before we get to that, the Lord tells us, let us fear. Let's, whoa, 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 let's, wait a minute. Let's fear lest any of you seem to have come short. Not even have come, just seem. It doesn't look, Todd, like you've got everything Jesus has. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. And so is the Lord. No, he's not. Right? Well, he's allowing it, isn't he? It's entirely different. Was the Lord allowing Israel to be his people under his covenant and in the land less than he wanted them to be? Question, what do you think? Did the Lord allow it? Yes, that's what we're studying. Do you think that they fully were enjoying and representing everything that God had intended for them? No, all right, we're on the same track. Verse two. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us, Christians, as well as it was to them, the people in the Old Testament, specifically Israel. That's what chapter 3 is. The good news. And that's really got to change people's understanding. If you think the gospel is just a few verses in 1 Corinthians, as is commonly taught today. No. The gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But... The word which they heard did not profit them. They didn't get the benefit. They didn't receive the fullness is what that means. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They had God's word. They had his covenant. They were his people. They were even in the land. But those commandments to go and drive out everybody didn't benefit them. And we really got to lay this foundation to get to the core of it because if you're a Christian... And you're thinking, I know there's a lot more in Christ, and it's, it's okay, and you know what? God's going to sort it out on the other end, and that's only partly true, right? God is sorting it out, but is it okay? Well, if we think it's okay because God's allowing it, here's a better question. Is this what the Father wants? Is this where I'd be the happiest, the most blessed? That answer is No. Compared to the Israelites in verse 3, for we who have believed do enter that rest, as he, the Lord, has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God was displeased with Israel. He spoke to them. They didn't believe. This is even before Joshua, right? There's giants in the land. Oh, oh, no. So God said, you're not going to enter my rest. Why? Because they didn't believe. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Do we understand what the Lord is communicating to us. Hey, the land is there. I've given it to you. I'm good for your word. Trust me, not yourself. Don't lean on your own understanding. All those things they did, it's there for you. It's good. No other preconditions have to be satisfied. Although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. God set forth a pattern in the creation week. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore, it remains that some must enter it. These words always challenge me, and I hope challenge you. Brothers and sisters, in your heart before the Lord, just ask, answer this question. Am I truly, Father, a person that wants to be part of the some? that wants to be one that enters your rest. Lord, we know that you want this. Somebody has to enter it. What is the Lord looking for? Volunteers? The answer is yes. The psalmist writes of Jesus, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your party. I'm here to encourage you. Volunteer. Lord, I want to be in that number, that old praise song, how I long to be in that number. Well, here's what the Lord says. You know, somebody's got to enter. Some of God's people have to enter his rest. And to those whom it was first preached, Israel did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David, in the Psalms, today, after such a long time, as has been said. If this is confusing for you, here's the Lord's point. Right? 
God said, somebody's got to enter that. And we're thinking, well, wait a minute. When Israel was in the land and we read in chapter 21, God was faithful. His promises were accomplished. The land had rest. Uh Uh-uh. That wasn't it. Because David writes, even after a long time, at six centuries later, by the inspiration of the Spirit. So he's saying, listen, if you're thinking that it was good and God's promise of rest, that which he prefigured in the creation week was satisfied. No, David's still writing about it. And the Lord continues on with your parts. He said, today, after such a long time, verse seven, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's always us, Christian, in your devotions, in this teaching, in any other thing. Lord, I'm seeking you, true and beautiful thing. The Lord communicates something to you. The hardening is, I'm going to receive that. Lord, I'm going to take you at face value. Or, oh, that was good information. Now I'm going to move without you. I'm going to go do my own. Oh, the Lord wants me there. Hey, they got iron chariots. It's hard. I'm going to go take this land. That was really, but what it tells us figuratively, God says, hey, there's real giants and strongholds in your life, right? How about those things that control us? Anger, impatience, lack of self-control. That's okay. No, I'm, I'm his. I'm in the land. It's all good. God's, faith. God's faithful, but is, have we truly taken all that land, taken advantage, trusted the Lord for all that promise? Those are the kinds of things that the Lord teaches us. I believe largely that the way the modern church deals with this is, you know, Scripture tells us about this a lot. So we need to move away from this and find something else that we like and seem to adjust the Lord's will to our liking. I was in a town recently for an appointment that is just, well, it it has a representation as being a super liberal town. And it is. There are rainbow flags everywhere. But this town has some of the most beautiful architecture, especially in the church buildings. I have to be careful not to say the churches. Oh, I'm going to the, the church, the structure. What a, what a ploy of Satan when we think, I'm in the church. No, this is, can be the church when God's people gathered together according to his purpose. It's the assembly, right? Oh, and those churches, they're magnificent. Some of the greatest stonework, just so impressive. Oh, and there's the political slogans. There's the rainbow flags. There's the... Reverend Shirley presiding. What happened? What happened? Did God change his word? No. Did they move without him? Did God allow it? Were all his promises fulfilled? No. No. That church, like any one of us, left a lot on the table. And this is what God's saying. Hey, you're outside of my rest. I'm using a word here, right? You're outside of the way I I really want and have made available for you. So again here in verse 8, this is what connects us to the book of Joshua. For if Joshua had given them, the Israelites, rest, for all the people thinking, I just read the end of chapter 21, their promises are fulfilled, they're in the land, it's good. that rest, not what I'm talking about. Because verse 8 tells us, if Joshua had given the rest, then he, the Lord, would not afterward have spoken in another day. He never would have moved David to write about these things. Today, if you'll hear his voice, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Now, David, in round numbers, lived and wrote at 1000 BC. That was a full millennium before Hebrews was written. Two millennium before we're reading it today. 3,000 years later, it doesn't matter. God says, right now, there's a rest for everyone who can hear his voice. And if that doesn't get your attention, okay, Lord, I'm hearing you, but I really need to know what you mean by rest because I'm sitting still. Is this not rest? Well, let's continue to read. Again, in verse nine, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Verse 10, for he who has entered his, the Lord's rest, has himself also ceased from his works 
as God did from his. To understand this, we need an example. The best example ever was and ever will be will be Jesus. When did Jesus do his own thing apart from the Father's will? Correct. Was Jesus always at rest? Yes. Being at rest simply means this. I've stopped doing my own thing. I've ceased from my own work. God wants this for Todd, but Todd says, I'm going to move without you. And I have. And it bothers me to think I might again, but this is the plan. Lord, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to lean on you. I'm going to ask you. And I know you're going to teach me and if or when I do, I'm going to come back as quick as possible. Right? Lord, I just moved without you. I know. I know. I've known from the foundations of the earth, from all eternity that was going to happen, just like he knew with Israel. See, there's a lot of examples that the Lord gives us in the teaching of Israel. And one of the the most important ones is here coming up. Did you notice, and I hope so because I pointed it out, but I've I've learned some things with you, brothers and sisters, especially in the areas of teaching. I just heard it again this morning. A brother said something in a presentation said, I never knew that as they went another way. I'm thinking, man, I've seen your face three different times when I taught that. Just like the Lord does to me, right? We're reading through this, reading through that. I never, we don't get it until the Lord wants us to get it. So because that's a fact, I want to ask the question, did you notice in Hebrews chapter four, one through 10, that God said, He preached the gospel or the good news to Israel? If you haven't seen it, please go back and read it. What does the Lord mean? I had good news for them. I was like, what? Offering these sacrifices? That wasn't bad. That's what the Lord wanted to show them something. No, the good news, I'm going to summarize it was, God said, this is me, God. I've chosen you. I will do good things for you if you trust me. God speaks and people believe. That's what necessary for the good news. You can know me. You can be mine or represent me. We can be in a unique relationship. All of those things together. But it's, it's based on simply believing God's word. How do we know that that's not an oversimplification? Because God says of Abraham to the church, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. The word gospel isn't used, but that was good news to Abraham wow, I came into a a right relationship with the Lord. He spoke, I believed him. He said he was going to do impossible things. I mean, impossible things. You're going to have kids. You're going to be the father of many nations. I'm too old. My wife's too old. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him by the Lord as righteousness. So the best news, the biggest example here today as It is with us now in Christ, as was given to us as an example, God's plan has always been about grace. The good news is what Israel didn't take advantage of was the Lord never intended them to. There's nations stronger and scarier and mightier and harder to deal with, just like those things in my life. I've tried to change myself. I can't. The Lord never intended me to change myself. The Lord never intended them. Once he got them to the land, said, all right, take over now, folks. No, how do we know that? Because he said that even before. Let's go ahead and uh, review this uh, really kind of quickly. Exodus chapter 23. We saw a little bit here and before the announcements, if you were up here with us, about Israel wandering through the wilderness during the exodus when God led them out of Egypt. In Exodus, the 23rd chapter, as the Lord speaks to Moses as his spokesman for Israel, we see in chapter 23 and how much context Let's back it up to verse 23, please. There's certainly more to read, but notice this, right? The title of the teaching today, don't forget about Jesus. You know, there's something interesting in the New Testament. The Lord moved the Apostle Paul to write to the church in Corinth. You know, 
the rock, if I'll, that was Christ. You know, Jesus was there with Israel even before the incarnation, before he was born as a human being. I think there might be a reference here, although not stated that way. Let's read it here in Exodus chapter 23, verse 23. The Lord says to Moses, for my angel will go before you. Now, literally, it's a messenger. Your translation may capitalize that, but that's, that's something that the editors did. And I think they did it for good reason, for reasons we're going to say. Hey, there's a messenger that's going with. God's presence was going with Israel. Well, yeah, you know that, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day, he was always manifest. But no, God was there with the people. He was talking to them. They didn't want to hear him. But the Lord says to Moses, for my angel will go before you, right? Even before they get there, right? It's not like they have to pioneer these things. My angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and to the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I will cut them off, right? I'm gonna, the Jebusites were still in Jerusalem in Joshua, right? God said, I'll do this. Do you think God changed his mind? No, he didn't. Israel just failed to trust the Lord, to seek the Lord, to allow the Lord to do for them what they could not do for themselves. As it was with the Israelites, so it is for me and for you if you're a Christian. If you're having problems and you're defeated and pretty soon you've you've moved on into the Joshua Israelite uh, mode at this point because they're in the land, I'm in Christ. God has given promises, and oh boy, has he ever in 2 Peter. And I don't have everything that, but I know it, and it's just, it's hard. I don't like to think about it, so I'm focusing elsewhere. That's what Israel's doing, right? Trouble in the promised land. We're going to see more about it here. Well, the the whole narrative continues on through Joshua and into Judges. It's not like it didn't matter. The Lord says, hey, be sure your sin will find you out. This stuff's going to come back to bite you. And it will be. We'll be studying more of that in Joshua. But we're taking the point from this right now. Oh, that won't be a problem. No, it's going to be. I mean, how many more teachings can I sit through where the Lord points to me after I ask, Father, I want to hear from you today. It's like, kid, I've got more for you. I want to do this. Oh, no, I've tried that. It's hard. I don't want to. The world has offered me a better alternative. Popular philosophy says this, but it's different than what God says. But the world likes it. That's what happened in those churches in that town that I told you about, I believe. Nothing new under the sun. The Lord told Israel, my angel, verse 23 of Exodus 23, will go before you. He will bring you in to the Amorites and the Hittites, those seven nations stronger. Verse 24, you shall not bow down to their gods. Remember that, that the commandment, the big commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. That was a big one with Jesus. We'll talk about commandments in a moment. It's a very necessary reason here and probably the main application this morning. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. Hey, we saw archaeological evidence this morning that they partially did it, but partially is never going to carry the day. You might, see, you might well get that momentary rest, but believe me, something's brewing. It's coming back to get you. The Lord continued speaking to Israel before he took them to the land. Verse 25, so you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take the sickness away from the midst of you. This is like the blessings that Moses told him again in Deuteronomy 28 and following. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. You know, that's not such a big thing in our world. It's a big thing with God's people, but it was even a bigger thing in that society because that was like, every good thing on this earth, your family, and it, it's continuance, right? And the death of a child, could there, it's like, what? Everybody's having miscarriages and everybody has problems. God says, if you believe me, you won't. I'll make sure of it. Talk about a promise, right? But what about the enemies? 
Oh, oh, he also, let's not cut this short, verse 26. I will fulfill the number of your days. Oh yeah, it was great, but I died early. Won't happen. The Lord says, I'll send my fear before you. You know, enemies in the land. Like your reputation preceded you. Remember what happened at Jericho? A certain harlot, oh yeah, no, people heard about it. Their hearts melted within them. The Gibeonites, same deal. God being faithful. Israel was partially faithful. God was fully faithful. Wow, they were already beaten before Israel got there. They just had to come into the land. And God told them about it before it happened. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. They're going to run away. I'll send hornets before you which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. That sounds like a little thing, doesn't it? True and quick story. One of my colleagues back in the military days was one of the, uh, the, the Panama Rangers, the guys that, the Americans that went in, they took the airfield. And so here were these young men and these highly skilled guys and they dropped in intense enemy fire. The American forces prevailed, machine guns, all these things. And they literally drove the enemy off. And he said they had taken this ground, this friend and his squad, and they were behind this berm, right? So there's all these guys and the machine guns. They've just beaten the enemies and they're just regrouping. And the problem was this particular hill had a bee's nest. And the bees started coming out. He said, the next thing you know, it's like, it's like oh, oh. the bees drove them out. And he said, looking back, he said, here we are, these hardened rangers. We had just gone through this firefight and mortar fire and machine gun fire. and press. The bees came and they went out. God knows what he's doing here. I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out. Be, please notice the, the language our Lord uses here in the next couple verses. I will not drive them out from before you in one year. It's a process, this growing, learning to know and trust the Lord. Lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, and I'm going to put the emphasis on here again. I will drive them out from before you until you've increased and you inherited the land. All those problems you think you have, God's already got it figured in. Why well, can't go in? I, it's just more than I know how to do right now. The Lord is going to advance us until he's going to increase our capacity. And the Lord continues with his promises, but we're just going to kind of hold there for a moment. The point is this, the example God gave to Israel for us today and every moment forward, the way he set them up is the way he set us up. The things that he promised them that were completed ahead of time, the same things that he promised were completed ahead of time for us. God knows how to take us through. God can do it. So when we see an obstacle, are we going to be like the Israelites? I say, oh, I don't think there's that. I'm going, to, I'm going to go someplace else. They did. It remains to be seen if we will. If we have, well, the correction is easy. But it's always been about God's grace. Not what you can do, what, not what we know. Not about us trying harder, but us believing in almighty, all kind, all loving, all super prepared God. Hey, there was a handout here, the grace handout. Maybe you have it in your Bible. I just want to remind you of one portion of this. One brother noticed these things about grace, and he recorded it here in uh, section one, Roman numeral one, the nature of grace, the, uh, the third... Item. Now, this brother said of grace, grace also is sovereign, right? Grace is all of God's goodness freely given to us. It's made available to us through faith in Christ, of course, right? But it's sovereign. God determines, not us. That's so important. God says, I want you in this land. I don't think this land is best for us. I'm going, no, no, no. No, God's very best is tied up in his sovereign choice. Now, what does sovereign mean? He's the highest authority. No one is over God. The problem is when we, like the Israelites, put ourselves over him. I know God says that, but I think this is better. Never will be the case. So this brother said, grace also is sovereign. Not having debts to pay. Here's a trap. 
Christians. Oh, I know, I just got to work harder. I got to believe. No, 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 no. You just have to put your faith in the Lord. You don't have to know how it's going to work out. There's giants. I don't think the Lord figured, I, the Lord doesn't know how deeply entrenched this tendency is in me. Really? What doesn't the Lord know? The Lord knows everything. Yeah, but I felt like I was on my own. The Lord's everywhere. You were never on your own. He'll never leave you nor forsake. All those things, all those objects we put up in our natural mind that Satan likes to work with us on. Continuing on here in the third point, not having debts to pay or fulfilled condition on man's part to wait for. That's it. When God said to them, hey, here's the land, go and take it so we can enjoy this together, you can learn about me. Nothing needed to be done by Israel. God needed to act. The scripture tells us God acts for the one who, anybody know the rest of it? Waits for him. Okay, Lord, you said you would do this. Waiting here for you. Because there's a timing. Okay, now we're moving to the, did you notice how the progression through the land in Joshua was? Now this city. Now this place. Now, the, who picks? God. Okay. Well, what's there for us to do? Stay with God, enjoy God, represent God. That's what grace is. That's the good news. Not how us with God helping and a whole lot of our effort are going to somehow muddle through this. That is not how Jesus lived. That is not what he represented. That's not who we are in Christ. So it's always been about grace. One thing I said that's kind of a sticking point, this whole commandment thing, because I think it's at least possibly hard for you like it is for me when I approach the Lord and his word. The Old Testament, different covenant, doesn't really apply to me. The Lord works hard to teach us. No, listen, I've given you examples here. Yeah, but there's all these commandments. See, the law, the Old Testament is about what they had to do. It wasn't about that. It's about what God would do if they trusted him. Now, the evidence of the trust is the obedience. Go over here. Do this. Do that. Okay. Okay. And God did all the heavy lifting. Right? Did all the provision, all the protection, all the healing. Would have had they trusted him. Right? But those commandments, see, we're not under law, but we're under grace. Again, God's grace is prevalent in the Old Testament. But the commandments, see, for the Christian, there are no commandments. Let me ask that in the form of a question. Christian, are there commandments for us in the New Testament? Yes or no? Just two. What are they? Let me rephrase that. Are there commandments for us in the New Testament? That's recorded in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament times, Jesus before the cross, right? He was asked by the friend, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? To which the Lord replied. How about in the New Testament? The answer is still yes. And I think what was codified in the law is still the Lord's desire. How about this one? Jesus had a new commandment I give you. You love one another. How about one that apparently was given, we don't know when, but it's clearly there. The church, the Lord Jesus quotes, the Bible quotes the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which has come upon the whole earth. So the answer, brothers and sisters, is there are commandments in the New Testament. Here's the question. Well, so doesn't that just put us into the area of law and not grace? Because there's a, going to use a term because I don't know a better term I can describe it, a, a position called antinomianism. It's from the word meaning the law. I mean, there is no law for us in Christ, right? I, through the law, died to the law. Right? That I might be married to another. Well, that's true. Of course, it's all true. We ask the Lord, make us what you want us to be. He said, all right, I'm going to increase your understanding little by little. Here it comes. There's commandments in the New Testament, just like the Old Testament. 
But here's the deal. It's not about us doing them. Just like it wasn't about them doing them, but us believing the Lord. Hey, I've come across a quote that's familiar, I think, to several of you from a brother who was used mightily of the Lord in this specific area on commandments. So I want you to hear this, consider it, test it scripturally. One brother said on the area of commandments, because instinctively we go, I'm, I'm in Christ. There's no commandment. There's nothing I have to do. That's kind of true. It depends how you understand it. But here's the quote. This brother said, all of the Lord's commands to me, brother was a Christian, obviously, all the Lord's commands to me are according to the new nature I already have. If Jesus is commanding something in the church, he's commanding the new man. The old man doesn't obey the Lord's commandments, obviously. The brother goes on to say of the Lord, he is my life. And all his words are the expression of that life. Think of that passage that we have been using a lot somewhat recently from Galatians chapter 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or else, or to live is Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, right? So that's what the brother is referring to. This is what God says. For us Christians, you've got two natures, the new and the old. For the new one, oh, it's all about what the Lord can do and will do. Now, for that to happen, there seems to be a whole lot in the New Testament, right? Like, you know, Ephesians, the first three chapters, who you are in Christ, read the next three, four, five, and six, all about what you need to do. Right? Well, it's not like the word commandment is used, but it's a clear instruction. So how do we reconcile that? Back to what our brother said. All of our Lord's commands to me are according to the new nature I already have. He is my life. All his words are the expression of that life. Therefore, when his words are given to me, when the Lord by his spirit applies any of these things to me, right? Don't get hung up. Has he given me a commandment or is it just not a reference? No, it's, it's God's word, which is spirit and it is life. When his words are given to me, they only give me, keyword, the authority to do what my new nature likes to do. That's how it is. If I'm in the old nature, it doesn't, it's not on board with what God wants. Let's not deceive ourselves. Never is, never will be. The new nature loves the things of God. When God gives a commandment, love one another, that's what his spirit in me, who he recreated me, already likes doing. Waiting for that opportunity. Now the brother noticed this and he, he used this quote and that's why I'm using it because it's so clearly, at least to me, puts it like God's commandment to my new nature is, gives authority. Already clears the way. It's like saying to Israel, the land's yours. Go ahead and take this part right now. All authority has been given. We'll, we'll give another example on this concept of authority that I think will help us think about this. When his word are given to me, they only give me the authority to do what my new nature likes to do. A new command I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. 1 John 2, 8. The Lord's saying, that's true in the Lord. And it's true in our new nature. Think Jesus, right? I delight to do it. I only do it, please. Oh, Jesus, oh, guys, I'd like to be hanging with you at the wedding. I gotta go do what the Father's telling me to do. No, no, not you either. When the Lord directs you, you guys come and say, oh, the Lord told me to do it. It's just fantastic. That's the new life. That's our promised land, if you will. So 1 John 2, 8, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, right? In other words, when God speaks, the new nature likes to do it. And when God speaks a commandment, he's just opened up the door and said, you can do this, kid. It's all before you, like Israel. I've given it all to you, right? He says one more thing in this quote, because this is, I think, the, the painful part of being a Christian when we don't understand this. God tells me, be holy, therefore, for I am holy, right? I can't, I can't do that. 
No. How about what Jesus replied to that teacher said? What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. I want to do that. Problem is I just can't, right? Everything, I'm sure if you tracked all of my activities over time since being a Christian, you would find time in there where it doesn't seem like Todd's loving the Lord with everything that he's got. I want, want to, right? So this brother, in light of those realities, with human understanding, asks the question, does our father mock us by bidding or commanding us to do what he knows we are unable to do? No. He gives commands we cannot perform in our strength that we may know what we ought to request from him. So simple, but so completely biblically right on. There's giants there. Lord, you've given me the land. How do you want to do this? Ah, okay, go wait over here. I'll send some bees. Oh, yeah, you told us about that. Or just walk around this. However you want to do it, Lord. But since you said, here's the boundaries, and we get a lot of boundaries in Scripture, and a lot of things that the Lord said are true of me, but they haven't been true in my reality. Lord, you would really like to see me take some more of this land, wouldn't you? No, Todd. I would really like to see you come to me so I can take some more of the land and you can inhabit it. It makes all the difference. The commands, well, they're the authority. God does not give us things that he cannot do. But he does give us a long list of stuff that we can't do. Israel's answer, ignore it. Do what you can. I don't know what they were thinking. I just know it didn't work out too well for them. So this idea on authority, say there's a place that maybe you want to go hypothetically Hawaii. Pick your island, right, if that's a place. Or if the Hawaii doesn't work for you, put some other place. You always wanted to go to Israel. Let's go there, okay? You want to see the place where Jesus walked. Hey, hey. There's all kinds of things, man. There's visas, there's expense, there's airfare, there's hotels, there's, I don't really know my way around Israel. I could go all this. So somebody comes to you, I'll go say, hey, here's the deal. Uh, right? Trip to Israel. The president, the guy in authority, said to the airline, I want round trip first class tickets to and fro Tel Aviv in this person's your name. Person in authority gave the command. It happened. Well, your boss said, I've given you the time off with pay. He's an authority. He can do that. Right? There's a hotel there because the guy at the president of the hotel chain in authority said, here's the best suite that we have. Lined out for those dates. And on and on and on. See the point? and you stay here in Toledo. What? Excuse me? Everything by all the authorities lined up, the authority issuing the visa, that's what God is saying. When I give you a command, I'm just saying, you got a clear path to allow me to produce and do in you everything that I want to do. That's what the commands are. Not what you can do, but what only the Lord can do in us. Now, on the subject of authority, and we really need to think this way, on commands. And I think it's what's being witnessed in Israel. If they would have known this, they would have been unstoppable. If they would have believed it, if they would have trusted, if they would have practiced. Now, I, I can't do anything for Israel, but we have this opportunity. And maybe the only person that the Lord is teaching is me, myself, because this excites me to no end. We've been asking the Lord, make us the church. So is there any aspect where we're not already the church? Well, we can be. If it's already in here, the highest authority has spoken. Let's, let's finish up here today with uh, a couple of verses on authority. Please go to the right, New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. The last thing that Matthew records, Jesus said to his disciples before he went back home. A little bit of context, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. We read, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Well, there's the human response. 
And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How helpful of Jesus to say that. He, he wasn't just building himself up. Like, listen, you're wondering, yeah, they were still not perhaps entirely clear. What about the Father says, hey, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Doesn't mean the Father doesn't have an authority. They're just all one. Jesus' words have the full weight of God because he's fully God. All authority. Right? So anything Jesus says, well, there's no one who can stand against it or contradict it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe a few of the things that are easy for them that I have. Nope. Here it is, guys. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is going to command something. Teach him to do it. The Lord will do this. He'll never leave us. He'll never be on your own. Like Israel, did they? Here's what I think Israel did. And here's why that interesting introduction at the beginning. The Lord's right here. He's given the command. He's ready, willing, and more than able. And they just, I don't know, internally said, what do we think? Well, you wait here, Lord. I'm going to, you know, there's giants. This is the land he wants. We're going to go over there. Well, here's how he'd like the church to be. This is what we like. Why? Well, it's hard and it's people. It's like, listen, the command has been given. The way has been cleared. All power is behind that. There's nothing stopping but one thing that the Lord said in the book of Hebrews. Unbelief. I'm not going to trust the Lord. I'm not going to acknowledge him. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. We'll finish up in this one. Last verse for today, 1 John chapter 5. We've already referred to 1 John. But to really reinforce the idea, especially of this brother's quote here, man, no, if God gives me a command, it's something my new nature already wants to do. It's, a, it's, it's not a grudging obligation. In 1 John chapter 5, We'll get just a, a little bit of context here. Let's look at the first five verses together this morning as we close up here. 1 John chapter 5, please notice the first word of verse 1. Whoever. Who's excluded by that? Nobody with the following conditions. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the way, the truth, the life, the savior of the world. There is none other. There's a lot there. It's not just that the demons believe he has a title, right? Whoever believes, put this trust in the nature of Jesus, is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who is begotten of him. See, there was a problem then, like there is today, right? Oh, no, no, we really love the father, but the son is a lesser. No, you can't have the Father without the Son or vice versa here. You're not going to think of one lesser than the other here. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. God said, the way is open. I, I will do all of this through you. Just trust me. Okay, Lord, you know I can't do that. Yeah, I, I know. Just follow my lead, kid. Over here. Okay, do that. It's like, oh my gosh, it's entirely different. It's not me doing it. For this, please notice verse three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. What? The fact that we love him or he loves us. Yes, right? God's giving nature for God so loved the world that he gave. His grace is all about God giving, right? And us receiving all of his good and grace for grace. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Simply put this, God says, do it. Okay, I love, and I just want the Lord to have his way and to be represented keeping his commandments. Unlike Israel, that was a bad example that we're studying in Joshua. That's a what not to do thing. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. The old nature is overcome by the world. The new nature overcomes that. Israel, in their failure 
an example of, well, we can't take this area. It's too tough for us. That was the old way of thinking. And they said, wait, no, God said do it. Joshua, Caleb, <laughs> let's, let's go get them. It'll be bread for us. Right? This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If I can describe that, our trust in the one who can do all things to do for us, through us, with us, all the things that he wants to do, all the things he has said, all that he has commanded. There's very much land yet to be possessed. It's a line from Joshua. I think that's supposed to be an example for us. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember Jesus, brothers and sisters. All authority has been given to him on heaven and earth. Jesus has commandments. Jesus and the Lord alone will accomplish all these things if we will but trust him. Amen? We're going to talk to him in a moment. But it should be eminently practical. If we understand just one thing, there's not one good thing that the Lord has commanded that he cannot accomplish. So what would it look like in a people who really believed it? Let's put our minds back in the Old Testament. What would it look like if Israel would have sat through the teaching today and really believed it? God will take care of all of those lands exactly as he said, if you'll but trust him, ask him to do it. And they say, oh, okay, well, wow. We, Lord, forgive us. We got away from you. Thanks for being merciful and not wiping us off the face of the earth here. It's not who the Lord is. <laughs> the Lord is gracious. Father, we went away. We're back. Okay, we're going to leave that area that you didn't designate for us. Lord, we want to see you glorified by bringing us into the land. How would you like to do it? I think that's what would have happened. More importantly, how's that going to happen for us? I want to pray with you, brothers and sisters, as well as for you. And just ask the Lord for certainly everything he wants, but just one thing clear. I know how it is with me. I can pretty much handle, by God's grace, one thing if he shows me at a time. Right? Lord, would you show me the one thing? What it looks like for me to demonstrate my love towards you and your love to your people. Because I know this. You might be directing me to stay in, in fellowship with people. And even though they're my brothers, sisters in Christ, we don't always act like it. And, you know, I don't even know this girl. I don't know this guy that much. And I don't really want to eat with them. And, and I, I'm comfortable over here. What would it look like if Jesus was here? Right? I want to be with Jesus. Amen. Right? Whoever serves me, where I am, there my servant shall be also. I said, him my father will honor. Holy cow. So I just want to ask the Lord to direct us. And more than that, this. To keep that conscious awareness that he is here or he's there. Because he's right here. I don't want to do that Israelite Old Testament thing and look away from Jesus. I think that's a practice that we can fall into. It's a pitfall to be avoided. But there's new and greater land, if you will, to be experienced if we will come to the Lord in faith and say, Lord, there's still very much land yet to be repossessed. Show us what portion you have for us today. And Lord, cause us to walk in it for your glory. Father, these things I ask would be for you, Lord, but I want to always stay yielded, Father, to what's on your mind. We are collectively a group of people that come together and ask, Lord, for what you desire. You made it very real and personal for me today where I can say things in this assembly that aren't true. He's saying, I will not, I won't move without you. Lord, I don't want to, but I'm incapable of moving with you by myself. So, Father, I just want to come together with you and all of your people who have the same heart that you've given and say, Lord, we know that you take us through the land little by little. Let us not look on what's not yet conquered, but 
where you are today and what you want to accomplish today and right now. And I'm asking, Father, that you speak to me and I thank you that you already have, but that you speak to all who are present and all who may be uh, listening to the teaching today of what's most needed, what your heart most yearns to accomplish perhaps the ground in the, the biblical way of speaking, Lord, that hasn't been yet taken back from the ruler of this world in our lives, in our experiences. Father, that you might be honored, that we might do so with joy, and that in so trusting you, Lord, we become a little bit more today like the church you want us to be. We ask these things, and Father, now yielding to you collectively, Is there something in addition that you would say to us as a group, Lord, before we stand together to to sing your praises because you are worthy? We ask as we wait upon you. Father, 